Welcome to Polychromatic Dimensions, and I'm your host, Hideko Mills, and today is Saturday, February 15th, and we have on the other end of the line here, we have Dolores Catherino. And so, hi, Dolores. Hey, good morning. Um, so I, I am a former musician uh, in that you and I have worked together in uh, various musical projects, but I've never studied music, so I'm not sure what polychromatic means. So can you help help us understand what uh, polychromatic music means? I think if you try to imagine a piano and the keys are black and white, and so what it gives you is 12 notes for each octave. Now, if you want to have more than 12 notes, uh, an easier way to approach the situation is to just say if we take the key C, which is a white key, and you divide it into let's say two divisions. Well, what if we made each division red and yellow? Then when you write it down in notation or you write it in tab as C with the under case R or C under case uh, O, then you're able to quickly write down all of these micro pitch notes. What I found is you can go way beyond 100 notes per octave by colorizing the way that we think of pitch. Uh, when you say colorizing, is, uh, does that actually translate into uh, pitches that perhaps sound out of tune to, say, the layperson? Yes, and that's only a, a matter of familiarity, because okay. what I found over the many years I've been working with it is our ears have a great degree of precision when it comes to pitch. And the more that you start to listen uh, to micro pitch music, the more your ear becomes accommodated. And what happens is it's almost a flip when you go back and you listen to the music that's just chromatic with 12 notes. It just sounds like there's huge gaps between each note on the piano. And so it's really a shift of, of how we perceive pitch. So what, what kind of instruments can actually execute polychromatic uh, tones and pitches? Um, well, the ones that I use primarily are keyboard controllers uh, because um, lately over the past 15 years, new controllers have come out uh, with key switches, distinct notes that you can program for 72 or uh, over 100 notes per octave. Um, and I'm aware that uh, there are guitar players that use uh, fretboards that can have 22 notes per octave or 17 or 19. Um, it's a matter of just uh, having somebody reconfigure the frets on your instrument. And uh, with um, mechanical instruments like uh, woodwinds and brass, uh, it, it looks like it, there's a guy named uh, Philip Gerschlauer, and he shows a video of him playing 128 notes in one octave, which is phenomenal. I had, I'm a saxophone player. I had no idea you could get that level of precision. Um, and so with brass and other uh, woodwind instruments, it is possible. It's just very, very difficult. So um, it, it's hard to know how that would proceed in the future because even learning chromatic music with 12 notes is so difficult already. Mm -hmm. So in the Western culture, uh, we're, we're so used to the 12 notes basically, right? And, and, and octaves to the left and right, for example. I've understood that um, um, from a from an ear standpoint, since, uh, you know, I, I can't read music, basically. <laughs> so I've always played by ear. And uh, I can recall uh, many, many years ago, uh, hearing different cultural music and uh, wondering about that. I just couldn't, uh, didn't have words for it. So in the Western culture, are there... Um, applications of, of polychromatic music currently in use? For example, uh, are, are there bands that are starting to use instruments that are uh, uh, capable of playing between what we know as 12 notes? Or are there applications in film or TV that you know of? Um, yes. Uh, right now, that type of music would be called microtonal. And so... Um, what microtonal music entails is all of these different scale methods, but they each have their own terminology and written language. So as a musician, for me to go from uh, a 13 tone system to say a 43 tone system, the symbols would be all different, the terminology would be different. And 
you know, just thinking as a multi-instrumentalist, I just wanted to create this foundational system so that you can seamlessly move from each type of scale to another. And to answer your question about the, the use of it, there are a few bands and actually the Zen Harmonic Alliance on, the fa on Facebook uh, is really um, a great forum that's showing all the latest work that's being done with uh, microtonal music. Um, but again, using the word microtonal, it's all very separated into different scale method camps, and they all have their own musical language. And, and from my perspective, that's the biggest thing that hinders it from a greater um, intensive acceptance uh, is just the ease of switching back and forth to different flavors or different palettes of colors. That's at, on many levels, a whole poly, polychromatic concept. Uh, it, it, extends into the way that we think about pitch as color. So now all of these microtonal scales, you think of them as a, a palette with different hues of color and you're able to make a painting with that. But you don't wanna have to learn, you know, all of the new colors on each palette. You wanna have a consistency of, uh, you know, a basic foundation that you can start from. Gotcha. So I, I've known you to play, uh, as you mentioned, uh, sax, uh, soprano sax specifically, and I've uh, seen you play keyboard and guitar and bass, and, and frankly, I, I, I think you can, whatever you put your hands on, you'll be able to learn like in a heartbeat. So, so say more about how you're executing it through the instruments that you're using now. I see that you've got a, a key, a, a regular keyboard that I'm, used to saying behind you, but you also have uh, a, a different kind of keyboard that kind of looks like a checkerboard-ish. Um, so tell me about that keyboard. Well, that one is a, it's a MIDI keyboard controller. So each key is actually just a key switch and the, they're shaped like hexagons. And because that's a much smaller shape, you're able to fit many more keys within the hand span of an octave. So in this case, 72 pitches per octave. Um, and if you look at it closely, it has the same two, three configuration of the black notes, like a piano. And so that's the way you could just uh, orient yourself with this new instrument. You just, it's almost like uh, an organ with six different keyboards all stacked on top of each other and consolidated into one controller. And so was there a uh, method of playing that particular instrument or did you have to create your own method of how to uh, move your left and right hands across that keyboard? Oh yeah, uh, these instruments that have come out like the tonal plexus and this one you see behind me called the microzone, um, they were blank slates. So incredibly innovative creations, uh, but nobody had really created a technique or a system uh, to work with the instrument yet. And for me, that's what I love, that kind of ambiguity, because I'll sit and spend a lot of time trying different things. And I've tried all kinds of um, ways of elevating the keyboard to find out what's too much and what's not enough. Because when you're going uh, backwards, you know, farther away from yourself, you're reaching out. And I found that a little bit of an elevation on the back end of the keyboard really helps uh, with wrist strain. Ah. Um, so things like that. Sure. I, I can relate to wrist strain from a, uh, being a guitar player <laughs> in terms of, you know, the guitar being a little too low and like a lot of the old rock and rollers back in the day versus the jazz guys and gals that would, you know, play the uh, guitar a little bit higher up. And I used to play it higher up to avoid that kind of wrist strain. Um, um, so that keyboard, for example, I remember when you first played it, uh, and I wasn't in front of you, I think I saw a video uh, on your YouTube channel. And I noticed that when you hit one note, it sounds like multiple octaves. Is that accurate? Uh, what, you mean just hitting a single pitch? Yes. Well, what you're hearing are all the harmonics that are in the sound patch. And okay. that's really why I picked that sound patch was um, to try to demonstrate not only the combination of micro pitches, mm -hmm. but how all of the harmonics and the, the phase differences interact when you put them in harmony. Mm -hmm. Because it almost, the, the way it feels like to me is uh, they're audible shapes 
that are moving in space. Mm. They're dynamic. So they're changing shape and they're moving in space. And immediately you come across a problem of we don't have the vocabulary in English to express auditory structures or um, auditory movement. So I have to keep using metaphors. And um, so sometimes that's confusing for people. I see. So, so in order to help someone understand um, how, how this sort of applies, it, it, let's say you were collaborating with someone uh, and let's say that that person is a guitarist. I don't know who we could think of, by anything, but uh, I mean, let's say uh, uh, a guitarist who perhaps did read music, right? How would you uh, chart out something um, uh, some sheet music so that guitarist could follow along and 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 let's assume that guitarist only plays six strings uh, 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 versus the you know twelve strings and and beyond these days. Well, the first um, the first thing to address would be uh, how that fretboard is laid out. Mm -hmm. So you know, do you have a guitar that can play seventeen notes per octave? Mm. And if you do then I'm able to write that out in a tab notation by colorizing uh, each of the notes that you're gonna play. Um, or if you read traditional music, then I colorize the notes. But the first thing would be that you actually have an instrument that can play those pitches. I see. So, so if you and I were to say, sit down and play and assuming that I could uh, read um, and, and I didn't have an instrument that could uh, play uh, many different pitches, but I wanted to see what you were writing. It sounds like what, what would be in front of me would be colored uh, notes, basically, um, representing the, the various pitches in between the 12 uh, notes. Right, and, and um, the way that I would think about it, uh, coming from the perspective of playing the guitar is just thinking that, okay, every note that you play on a conventional guitar just imagine that there's two or three subdivisions in between. And so the way that we would describe those subdivisions, like first fret would be an F on the lowest string. So let's say we divide that into two. The way that we would distinguish those two could be F red and F yellow. If you had that fret that was in between, and then you would know which color of F to play when you see an F on the score or an F in tab. Okay. So I guess the closest thing that I can identify with that is uh, when a guitarist would bend a string um, to go from one, say, note to another note. And so it, you're saying that that color difference with F um, would be a bent note uh, somewhere in between the, from, you know, half step or a whole step when you bend a note. That color would reside somewhere in, the, in, in between. Yes. And that's, okay. that's why it's almost like the color continuum, the, the, it's a shortcut to use these discrete, you know, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and go mm -hmm. violet. It's a continuum, but there's no way to really express that yet in mm -hmm. a, you know, a written form, a written score, because it's, it's, it's a continuum. It's not a discrete color. Sure. Um, and as far as bending notes on the, on the, uh, on any instrument, uh, the use of fixed pitch instruments that can really hone your your discrimination of pitch um, really helps so that if somebody says, hey, Hideko, can you bend that like, you know, a half a pitch it, or make it a quarter tone, just do a mm -hmm. quarter tone. Mm -hmm. Well, if you don't have a good conception of what a quarter tone is, where mm -hmm. you're going, then, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to be as precise as if you had kind of studied, okay, this is the pitch I'm aiming for. Sure. Um, and I think that's where the keyboard instruments really come in is, is that ear training, that foundation of developing your pitch discrimination. Right. And, and a stringed instrument would have to really become more precise, you know, not just uh, in terms of the bending of a string or strings, that they would have to be even more precise and have uh, more um, <laughs> muscle technique um, that perhaps they wouldn't, if you're not a, a guitarist, that would be able to uh, bend, bend notes, for example. So if, uh, are there guitars that are out there that can execute uh, with, let's say, a chord, let's say a three-note chord, 
um, where the three notes, perhaps let's say they represent the chord D, you're saying that of those three notes, I could either uh, play D, but in uh, uh, in between quarter notes, or 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 would there be additional strings that represent the and tune such that I'd have to simply uh, tune it differently? Well, there are some um, people. I think his name is Ron Sword, and he he creates custom necks. Um, and I would guess that other people do it and maybe do it on their own. Um, it's definitely uh, not mainstream, so you'd have to look online to find the people that are doing this. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other option, of course, is to just get rid of all the frets. Mm -hmm. And then when you have a fretless guitar, um, you know, a lot of other difficulties come in to play. Um, one of the things I noticed with the fretless bass is that um, playing two pitches at once you know, that's, that's challenging. And after a while you get that, um, the intonation with those two pitches down. But once you go beyond two, like say you're playing um, a triple stop, three pitches. Mm -hmm. Well, then you're like, well, okay, is the second pitch sharp compared to the first or is the third pitch flat compared to the first? You know, it just, because each interval is competing with the other interval. And so it gets far more confusing. I'm not sure how, uh, to simplify that aspect. But um, yeah, definitely, you know, if I was approaching microtonality now, uh, instead of a fretless one, I would probably start with a, a custom neck. The difficulty is that you have to choose one. So do you want 17? Do you want 22? Do you want 24? And then you're locked in. Um, so I don't know, maybe I hope that changes in the future. So guitars have more flexibility. Sure. So you know how uh, the the saying goes that the more languages you speak from your native language, um, uh, the more you are going to be able to dream in other languages, right? Where as you get become more comfortable with that new language. So are you essentially dreaming in in uh, polychromatic terms these days when you're thinking about composition? Uh, well, even before that, I remember when I was in college. Um, doing my undergrad in music, very vividly having um, a dream where I heard this music that was so incredible, and like nothing I'd ever heard before. And then there was that little consciousness of like, oh, you got to get up and write this down. That's how it works with composition. Uh -huh. But then that silent voice was just came in and said, just listen and enjoy it. You're not ready to write this down. No kidding. You don't know how to write this down. <laughs> and so it was this bizarre dream because... Usually, you know, at least it, I don't know if it's a myth, but there's certainly a lore that, you know, sometimes people have these dreams and then you wake up and you write it down and it's some fantastic thing. And, mm -hmm. and I thought that that was what this is. Mm. And so for now, um, I don't know if I have uh, dreams about the music. It's still a very um, ex exploration. It's, it's all about exploration for me. Sure. So um that's what's so thrilling about every composition is it just kind of opens up into this whole new area mm -hmm. and then you get to start over and go in this direction and see what's over here. Sure. Um, I don't think I have the fluency in the language yet to be able to just think it up in my head or dream it in my head and then write it down, but okay. I'm working toward it. Sure. So how does, uh, or does percussion sort of uh, percussive elements play a role in what you're doing right now? You know, that's, uh, that's something I'm really trying to, to figure out because what happens with polychromatic music because of these uh, interactions of the phase, uh, mm -hmm. phase relationships, maybe the harmonics, the pitches, you end up with a sense of uh, all these rhythms happening in the chord. And they're kind of like polyrhythms, except that they're all kind of distinct. So there's no um, underlying pulse. I see. And so I was wondering, well, how would you superimpose a metrical type rhythm uh, on that? I mean, would it, would it clash or is there some way to accentuate this type? I don't even know what the word would be. It's, it's polyrhythm without a fundamental pulse. Or I should say each component has its own fundamental pulse and they're not the same. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know how... Uh, metrical rhythm would fit with that, but it would be a fun experiment to see if they clash or if somehow 
uh, it's like the 100 metronomes in a room and there's some sense that they all kind of converge into um, some kind of a, a meaningful foundational rhythm. Sure. In fact, one of the things that uh, you and I talked about some years ago uh, was, uh, or I should say, I asked you from having a producer's hat on, right? I, I, I was asking you what you were hoping to um, uh, accomplish. And in other words, were you thinking about moving in a direction that would uh, mean that your music, these new compositions would be uh, commercially available? Or would they be just for a select group of your audience? Uh, or if it's just for yourself? Um, because as a former producer, I was able to, you know, kind of have that conversation with an artist and then uh, together we would move in the direction of, yes, this person wants to sort of appeal to uh, a commercial market or, or this person just simply wants to have a product that's available to themselves. And so one of the things that I wondered about is um, if you thought, for instance, some of your compositions um, would fit within, say, uh, uh, film scoring, television scoring, that sort of thing, versus, let's say, the typical add a vocal on top of, you know, uh, the composition. Um, so from a, produ uh, from a production standpoint, there are a lot of folks, uh, artists, that um, will start with a rhythm, for example, and then will be a, a build chords and melody around that rhythm. And conversely, there are artists that start with a melody. And so for you, um, what would you say, uh, were, uh, how, how, what is your process on, in terms of starting the composition? How do you start to, uh, where does that come from and, and how do you execute those ideas that, that you have in your head? Um, <laughs> well, you know, I guess I, uh, initially I look at this whole language as um, something that I, in, in this context of our time, I want it to just be open, an open area of exploration because we, with copyright and everything, there's really this sense of contraction where people are getting sued for smaller and smaller bits of the musical language. Mm -hmm. And um, it's almost like a fresh world to start somewhere where everything is open. Mm -hmm. And um, there's kind of that sense of, you know, this is our language, we have to protect it. And so moving forward as more people explore the area, they continue to um, uh, to keep the language open. It, and that doesn't preclude any commercial interest because what happens with the Creative Commons is, uh, you know, what you can say is that, you know, hey, if, you, if you're using this stuff, then you need to make sure it stays open for other people to create with in the future. But you could still make money on your, your tunes and what you create. Mm -hmm. It's just that, you know, we're trying to make sure that people can continue being creative in whatever form uh, that they choose. Um, and in terms of like, there's so many implications and applications for polychromatic music um, that I think it's just a matter of, you know, the people I meet, the collaborations I form, which direction it would take. Uh, for me, as a solo person, I'm very, very interested in exploring all of this and, and making an intuitive system so that other people can take it in their own directions. Um, and maybe that's just a factor of being a little bit older. I'm not uh, after, um, you know, any kind of, you know, that whole game of, um, you know, trying to get a pop hit or something like that. Sure. Um, but uh, at the, the reason that say a collaboration um, with people that are in those different pop genres or, or classical soundtrack, uh, any type of musical area, the collaboration would be great because it, it brings in an accessibility to that world of listeners. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, say, if you're really into funk and fusion, then you look at this music and you say, oh, you know, there's a way we can tailor this to listeners that really have certain expectations in that genre. Mm -hmm. And then we see how all of these new pitch colors fit mm -hmm. in, you know, that particular application. It's, so it's one application of many. Maybe that's kind of a scientific way of approaching it. I understand now what you said to me a number of years ago, actually. I remember you saying um, that just about every composition that we in the Western world uh, know uh, 
it has been done. In other words, it's harder to create something new uh, within those 12 notes, um, whereas what you're doing allows for uh, absolutely new territory, new uh, compositions, uh, multidimensional uh, way of looking at and hearing music. And I remember when you said that, it resonated with me because of how many, uh, particularly because how many people are in fact blatantly using uh, music that was had already been uh, published, I should say, you know. And you were saying really nobody is creating anything new. Just about everything that we understand within the 12 notes has been done. And so that really uh, uh, hit me because I, that is the point where I started to understand that where you're going with, with um, your compositions are well beyond, you know, uh, the 12 note spectrum. So tell me a little bit more about um, how did you, how did you, and I know you recognize this uh, as a younger person, uh, actually very young, that you started to realize that this was very limited in terms of your brain. And so help me, uh, because I don't have your brain, <laughs> help me understand uh, uh, how, uh, what was it that pushed you besides your dream, basically, of uh, this is not, you won't understand it, you won't be able to write it down, but just enjoy it and, you know, it sort of then comes to you uh, better. So help me understand that transition. Well, I think my basic, uh, attitude towards sound and pitch always came from the continuum. Mm -hmm. So, you know, growing up in Michigan, you would hear the little sirens, the tornado sirens. Mm -hmm. And in my little town, they test them once a month. Mm -hmm. And so you just hear this beautiful, continuous pitch. It goes all the way up and all the way back down. Uh -huh. And so superimposed on that later was musical training where they chopped it up and said, oh, no, you only have these notes to work with. Mm. And so just it never made sense from that way because I was like, well, what about everything in between all those notes? I see. And um, the way that music is approached, maybe because of, you know, historically, you know, from a Pythagorean background, um, numbers have always been so associated with music. Mm -hmm. So um, it was based more on that kind of numerical um, foundation instead of saying, you know what, we have this whole continuum of pitches. It's like a continuum of color. Mm -hmm. So, you know, why can't I just select five colors or 10 or 40 or 80 mm -hmm. and then just start combining them and create a new work? So it was never an extension of the conventional way of thinking about pitch and music in numerical terms. It was really, if anything, coming from a visual perspective of how we work in the world with color. And, you know, when you look out over a forest, you, you know, you might say, oh, that's green. All those trees are green. But one thing my mother pointed out, who was a visual artist, is look at all the different shades of green. Some have brown mixed in them and some have orange mixed in them. And, you know, so all of a sudden you're like, but I don't have words for all those different kinds of green. Mm -hmm. And that's on a more simple level with pitch, we have black and white. So moving from black and white to you know, the segmented colors of, of, you know, the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Sure. Um, that's a good basis to start uh, moving away from this kind of chopped up pitch um, paradigm toward one where you really look at it as just this blend of colors, like you said earlier, where um, I don't, I'm not sure how we can even um, express that in a written language yet, because when I write down a note, it's got a color attached to it. Mm -hmm. versus like if you were singing or playing your guitar and bending that note, it would be nice if that color changed hue or mm -hmm. maybe even changed its primary color depending on how far you're bending. Mm -hmm. So you really get a sense in, in, in dynamic terms of what that pitch is doing. But it seems like that's pretty far away at this point. Well, you know, what's interesting about your life is that you actually – uh, are very much a scientific minded person. In fact, your family, are, uh, you, you come from a family of very, uh, 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 very much thinkers of uh, rational thought, rational uh, uh, evidence, for example, um, scientific based uh, way of thinking. 
and yet you've you know and i blame your parents but you know you've come from <laughs> you were able to somehow uh be given the gift of music coupled with your scientific the scientific part of your brain which i think is really really cool and so and as a result you you uh and, and sometimes you know science it feels sort of uh, b uh as if there's a boundary because you're you know the methodology was proven to work within these boundaries and yet you push yourself out of those boundaries to to take a look at uh take a look beyond i should say um, what we understand and what we're used to hearing say in, in the Western world in terms of what music is. Um, also years ago, I remember uh, we talked a little bit about colors uh, uh, in that I, I could relate with the, the notion of hearing uh, music, uh, uh, for example, chords as uh, more of a colorful uh, execution versus more of a you know uh, on off or one you know one zero sort of execution i i understood I, it resonated uh, with me when you started to use that word in particular in terms of what what you're doing now so in terms of what you're doing now um tell me about how you're uh, sort of getting uh, your message your compositions out there i know you've uh, got a YouTube channel. Uh, tell me about uh, a TED, TED talk that I actually attended um, uh, a couple years back or so. Um, tell me about that uh, experience and what was your process to uh, get your message into a what amounted to be what a 20 minute talk or so for for people that were in the audience that were uh, ranging from musicians to you know lay people to folks who had gone to school, uh, higher education to, you know, how, how did that, uh, how did you come to put that together? Well, the whole process with the TEDx organization in Sacramento was um, amazing on so many levels. Um, what happened was I had a YouTube channel and I had published kind of an introductory video on polychromatic music and um, modern keyboard controllers. And um, it took off pretty well. And then I received an invitation from the producer uh, of their next TEDx event. And um, the process was, uh, and, and I'm sure it's different for each one, but at the very beginning, um, it was clear that there would be no notes. You had to memorize it. And, you know, that was initially frightening because I, I, I didn't think of myself as a public speaker. But over time, you just realize it's exactly the same thing as memorizing a piece of music. Mm. And when you think about, uh, you know, sometimes we learn pieces of music that are 20 minutes long. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, you know, that's amazing. It really is the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I approached it that way. Uh, and then I think we probably, we got together about um, once or twice a week for six weeks. And... Uh, Every time we kind of go, I'd go through my script, you know, they kept saying, what does that word mean? What does this word mean? What is that? So go back and rewrite it. And I did rewrite it about six times, which made it difficult to memorize because, you know, you wanted to memorize the correct version. But it was such a good lesson in saying, um, you, you know, when we get specialized in a field, we learn precise language. But the problem with that precise language is it's esoteric. Anybody outside the field is either misinterprets it or has no idea what you're talking about. And so the real challenge is trying to use it in common language without sacrificing too much precision. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the big trade-off is. And I had never realized that before. I'd always been striving for more and more precision, but I didn't realize it made it harder for people to understand unless they were looking up things in a dictionary and, and trying to put it in the correct context. So that was the life changing lesson for me of, okay, you know, there are, there's a way of describing things that seems um, more clear to me and more precise and, and very careful about choosing which word I use. Um, but what's the point if I can't express that in everyday language to other people that might be interested. 
Sure. In fact, um, uh, I, I know that after your talk, having you know been in the audience, um, I could see people sort of light up and, and it sort of hit them that um, what you're doing is just so outside of their own experience, but yet they were welcome, uh, welcoming it. And, and you've got a lot of uh, folks starting to uh, reach out to you, whether it's through YouTube or uh, your TEDx talk to do more collaboration. So w tell me about the, uh, those types of collaborations. For example, you've got folks who are wanting to uh, touch base with you on, uh, because they're creating um, new instruments as a result, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, the Lumitone is this incredible instrument that's uh, about to go on an Indiegogo campaign. And- um, Indiegogo campaign? Yeah, the crowdfunding. Oh. Okay. See, yeah. Crowdfunding. I'm totally clear. Go ahead. Yeah. Crowdfunding. Okay. <laughs> but it's fantastic because, it, you know, they're using a lot of the latest technology as opposed to the microzone behind me. Instead of a key switch, this one actually has a, um, a kind of a lever switch, like a, a, an old fashioned, like a, a piano or something okay. like that. Uh -huh. And so that gives you a different tactile feel to it. Mm -hmm. um, it's still using the hexagonal keys, but they also have assignable color. So it's backlit color. Oh. And it's like, oh, next generation. That's fabulous. And the thing that's really uh, exciting that I'm uh, uh, thrilled to get my hands on it to, to just experiment is they used a cascade key design, which means the front keys are on a lower level and they kind of go up, 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 like a, uh -huh. like a pyramid. Okay. And I wondered as far as technique, you know, I'm always elevating my keyboards. Would this be effectively the same thing or is, would it require a totally different technique? Mm -hmm. And so because in my uh, experience with these prototype instruments, I'm very aware of it, it's a race against time to get enough interest and support before these companies just throw in the towel. I see. And so it's, it's really important for me to um, try to use whatever means I have to make more people interested in, in new instruments like the Lumitone to, to buy them so they can create the next generation. Otherwise it ends right there. And, um, you know, I, I, we're at this bizarre stage in our music history. When you walk into a guitar center, you know, it, it could be the late nineties. Mm -hmm. They're just, you, other than the electronics and the, their same keyboard, same drum, same mm -hmm. guitars. And so, it, you know, how does innovation creep in there? Everywhere else in our world, things are rapidly innovating. And I'm sure there's a, a comfort and nostalgia, you know, using the old fashioned instruments. Don't mean that in any negative way. Oh, but, sure. you know, these new uh, innovative designs, these are, are folks that are just um, outside the uh, mainstream of musical instrument making. And they're trying to get enough of a interested customer base to keep progressing. I mean, Rolly is an interesting case in point because they came out with this beautiful instrument, the Seaboard Grand. And um, I guess the sales weren't enough to keep it going and they discontinued it. And instead they're doing more uh, maybe laptop musician um, and uh, uh, producer type instruments. So they're really, really small, like the blocks, uh, you know, a, an interface and there's maybe a one octave new components. So they've gone in that direction. And as a musician, I, I really want to do all I can to promote these new instruments that uh, would be catered towards somebody who's going to spend the 10,000 hours and really going to show what this new design could do. Mm -hmm. So have you worked with any of the uh, commercial vendors at all or, or, or try to uh, convince them to sort of move beyond their... Uh, their strategic plan with respect to, you know, uh, the 12 keys, the 12 notes, that sort of thing? Um, well, you know, I, I guess I'm not quite sure how I would sell that idea because mm. uh, with a corporation that big, I mean, they're really looking at, you know, short-term profit. Sure. And when you're designing an innovative instrument, this could take five years or longer to get a self-sustaining model. Mm -hmm. And even though it's the future, I don't know which company makes the risk. Maybe like everything else, it would be a company like Amazon or Google that can afford to run um, a loss for five years I just see. to generate the interest and then 
have everybody move into their type of 21st century musical instruments. Sure, but, sure. Um, I just don't see that for Yamaha, Roland, Korg. I mean, these guys have got to continue to, to make a profit in an era where less people are, or I should say maybe more young people are, are moving toward laptop musicianship or um, creating beats and mm -hmm. um, not really using musical instruments, using the software to create music. And so what does that mean to a company that creates music hardware and musical instruments? Mm -hmm. um, I don't, you know, I guess I'm not sure how you would connect with people that might be looking that far ahead of sure. what the future plan is. Sure. I remember back in the um, 80s when we were still playing uh, instruments, executing instruments ourselves without the use of software and the introduction of drum machines uh, came out in those days. And, you know, one of the things that I re recall feeling uh, as an instrumentalist is, uh, did that just open the door for uh, mediocrity to, to, to be the uh, prominent um, uh, uh, execution of, uh, of a, 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 an instrument or a composition? And should I be, you know, uh, upset by that? Because all of a sudden people that didn't necessarily have the uh, skill to execute a, a real instrument as an in unplugged, you know, that sort of thing. But then as I listened to you, I, I, I started to realize how narrow-minded I am. I was by just saying, oh, it just means uh, the rise of mediocrity. But in fact, that may not, necessarily be all that's uh, happening. It's allowing people who probably didn't necessarily think of themselves as moving in a direction of a musical career, having a musical career. And that's a beautiful thing. And, yes. and it's sort of like the uh, back in those days, the, the live drummer who actually learned how to program um, uh, drum machines actually got more work because um, he or she was able to uh, um, use both mechanisms to execute and, and, and continue to find work. So it sounds like that's what's happening uh, uh, around what you're doing. You're, you're not looking at this the way perhaps I did with a drum machine. Oh my God, that just, you know, why are you sampling, you know, <laughs> when you can just play the thing live? And you're saying, yes. you know, the, mo the more the merrier, you're saying, Let's bring in other minds and other approaches to um, uh, executing music and composition. And so oh, I think, yes. yeah, I, I think it's There's great. actually like two different um, areas that are competing. One is this um, increasing ac accessibility for people. So, right. you know, if you are really good, you just have a great sense of rhythm, but you have no physical coordination, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden you have these tools to create phenomenal drum parts. Um, I think on the other hand, the difficulty is, and maybe it's coming from more of a um, financial point of view, where you just want to eliminate your costs. Yeah. So, hey, if I can use a drum machine instead of a drummer, you know, it's not going to be as good, but it's passable, then, then that's where the concern comes in over there. But mm -hmm. when I look at the trend, which is, you know, just turning on your radio, mm -hmm. more and more music has no musicians in it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's all created from a computer. It's, uh, um, it's heavily auto-tuned, heavily processed. Mm -hmm. And the first place my mind goes is in a society, usually what's valued is what is rare. Mm -hmm. And so over time, what's going to be rare is the virtuoso musician and the virtuoso right. live performer. You know, can this person do it unplugged? Mm -hmm. Can they, you know, create these beautiful compositions uh, with technology used as an adjunct? So it's something that brings them up to the next level instead of this technology is primary and I'm going to edit what the computer, the options the computer gives to me. Sure. Does that make sense? It it does, and you know, again, it 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 helps someone like me who uh, would honor the live musician and honor their uh, abilities and their, you know, ability to uh, execute their instrument to create an emotional response, and um, and sometimes 
uh, that emotional response is uh, so rare and moving that it, it feels like other approaches to the same uh, thing is not as moving, but maybe that's just because I'm old. <laughs> you know, because I, you know, I remember uh, uh, the folks that were our parents' age and older uh, saying the same thing about the tunes that we would listen to back in the day, you know, in terms of, oh, you know, that's not real music. Um, and I'm finding that I need to be mindful of uh, looking or uh, responding in, in a more respectful way to those who are, in fact, uh, creating, and, and that's the key word, they're creating and using different mechanisms than, say, people from my generation. Yes, and it's really interesting that word real, mm -hmm. um, how it's changed meaning. So for our parents' generation, um, it was a value judgment, you know, that isn't real music, you know, take a listen to Glenn Miller. I mean, mm -hmm. all those musicians, and now you're only using four musicians in a band. Mm -hmm. But from our perspective, real um, has more of a, um, a connotation of simulation. Mm -hmm. So when you hear a song on the radio and you say, that's not real, what you're saying is there are no humans playing any of that. Sure. It's all created artificially. It's manufactured. Mm -hmm. And um, see, I, I don't know. I guess I, I end up picking up on language and um, the way that uh, the semantics change and the way that the meanings are changing. And it becomes important when you are trying to um, understand what does it mean to be a musician in the 21st century? Mm -hmm. Because we came from that background where you put in your 10,000 hours, you do a lot of practicing and a lot of studying. Um, and so it's difficult because it's not our experience to understand people that are really good at production and they know logic and Cubase and all the digital audio workstations to such a level of expertise that they can create beautiful things um, at a very low cost because they're not hiring musicians. They're not in a studio. They're in their home uh, creating these things. And it's valuable in a different way. I mean, any way of expressing creativity is always a great thing. And so it's like, how do we, will English kind of distinguish those, a word to distinguish the two different types of musician? Or, you know, will we just start to look at it as these are all creative arts? They're just, you know, are you somebody that's really good, um, you know, with your coordination and your fingering and, and, you know, can you play really fast on an instrument if you practice long enough? Or does that have absolutely no interest to you and you'd rather, you know, master the software that can do phenomenal things just at your house? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thing about music is is the uh, for me it's always been about the emotional response. Uh, you know, for example, I I think I was uh, in another life. Uh, uh, I, I I lived in Cuba. I think just in terms of the um, for me the amazing rhythms uh, and how those rhythms are applied in in composition and in culture and community and that everybody in every family basically plays some sort of an instrument, you know, or uh, plays some sort of rhythmic uh, instrument at the least. And uh, it, it, it's always resonated. Uh, rhythm has always uh, resonated with me as a, as a result. And when playing with you, it's always been so exciting because you were able to take that melodic leap um, with let's say my i would play a rhythm behind you or and you'd be able to just fly and and for me to sit there and try to listen to it and, and play with you just it brings chills and uh and i miss the human part of uh musicianship these days i miss the fact that and i hope um that the those who are creating music let's say using computers and software my hope for them is that they they can experience that sort of human connection uh, when working with other musicians, and uh, the, the the notion of being able to uh, riff off of one another uh, as we used to do back in the day, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
So uh, tell me about um, the uh, responses that you, you're getting from folks as a result of your being on YouTube and um, uh, having a website fired up and doing the TED Talk, for instance. Is there a demographic that is resonating uh, that you're noticing, or is it uh, people that respond are across the board, across different countries? Um, uh, so, what what's your thought? What are your thoughts about who's responding? Um, well, uh, one thing that caught me by surprise was uh, with the YouTube stats. Um, was that about 38% of the views of my composition videos are in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So it's very um, diverse and widely spread throughout the world. Mm -hmm. And as far as feedback and comments, um, uh, there are two different types. One is kind of the listener, which is like, wow, this is something I never heard before. It's really, mm -hmm. you know, what's going on? And then there's a person who uh, is a musician or a composer and they want more specific information of, you know, how, how do you approach this polychromatic music thing and, and what does pitch color mean mm -hmm. and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the second trend, which is um, my latest composition I posted was called Expanse. And it wasn't planned this way, but it's a very accessible composition. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, when you listen to it, there's not as many, if you don't have any experience with this type of music, it's, it's, um, it's accessible. And I didn't, like I said, I didn't plan it that way, but the responses, you know, on one half you have the, well, probably most, more than half, you have people that are like, this is incredible. What's going on here? That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And then there's a smaller percentage, which are like, you know, push the boundaries, push it farther, push it farther. Mm -hmm. And so I definitely do want to push it farther. And I'm aware that uh, if you get too far out there too quickly, um, that uh, it, it might turn off listeners so that they don't take the time to get used to the new sound. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just want to sort of uh, wrap up the day uh, and just reiterating to you how much I respect you and what you've done through the years and, and always having this wonderful uh, attitude, a wonderful, upbeat way of looking at exploration and in helping old fogies like me who who are like what do you mean you don't play an instrument you know you've got to exit <laughs> um to be you know frankly more open and as a result of that uh openness uh you've really helped me understand uh that you you're doing something amazingly special and i look forward to continuing to talk to you about this uh as we move forward so Dolores, thanks for your time today, uh, for today's show. And uh, we will definitely be picking up uh, more conversations uh, in the future. And uh, I just want to thank you again for a wonderful chat today. This is <laughs> uh, Polychromatic Dimensions and uh, with my dear friend, Dolores Catherino. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.